name is David Kubios, and welcome to In the Margins. Uh, today, um, we are glad to have as our guest, uh, President uh, Vincent Rougeau. Um, he leads uh, College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts. And just want to say uh, thank you so much, President Rougeau, uh, for being here with us today. Um, my first question for you, uh, President Rougeau, can you talk uh, about your career and when you first became interested um, in higher ed leadership? I just want to talk a little bit about your background and your journey to Holy Cross. Sure. Uh, I'm, and thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, my uh, academic career started about three years after I finished law school. Uh, I uh, left law school and went to work at a, uh, a major law firm in Washington, D.C., but realized uh, after a couple of years that I wanted to find another path, professional pathway. Uh, and I was uh, I got interested in uh, in higher education, the possibility of being uh, a law professor. And fortunately, that I was able to, to do that. And I began teaching uh, in the early 90s and um, have been an academic ever since and in academia ever since. And in my early years, I didn't really think much about academic administration. You're really just thinking about, will I get tenure and working for that? But um, but I have to say early on, even when I was an assistant professor, it seemed that colleagues often identified me as someone who'd be uh, a good member of a committee or uh, you know started sort of drawing me into law school-wide or university-wide projects. And I think by the time I was tenured and you know, sort of a little more senior, I started uh, thinking more about administrative duties. I was an academic dean at Notre Dame Law School for three years. And um, so I, I guess I had an inkling uh, by that time that, uh, you know, higher ed administration might, might be something uh, I, I wanted to do. But it took a while before I really took the, the leap. Um, and it was about I know, almost after being a faculty member for almost 20 years that um, an opportunity to become a dean of a law school uh, was presented to me. And, and the first one so I tried for, I didn't get, but the uh, second one um, I did. And I became dean of Boston College Law School. And that was probably the moment where I realized that this was probably going to be my future pathway in academia. I would probably stay in, in administration. I was a dean for 10 years uh, and then after that became president of, of College of Holy Cross, which, you know, again, was a process of thinking and discerning whether or not uh, moving from being a law school dean to being a liberal arts college president was was the right shift. But uh, so far, it's, it's it's worked out really well. And indeed, um, you do represent a number of firsts um, at College of the Holy Cross. I think you mentioned uh, prior to yourself, um, um, there were people who were priests, who were president of College of the Holy Cross. And so, of course, um, you are the first lay president of Holy Cross, which, of course, is a, a significant um, transition, a significant uh, appointment. And of course, um, you are also the first um, African-American uh, leader of Holy Cross. I was wondering if you could talk about coming in at this moment um, in Holy Cross's history in higher education with all of these firsts. And, you know, I almost want to frame this question, looking at what's happening across higher education, look at what's happening nationally. You know, we've seen uh, the systemic uh, racism flashpoint nationally. And so it seems as if you uh, came into Holy Cross at a point of inflection, perhaps not just at that institution, but uh, even across the nations. So I was wondering if you could talk about um, the firsts when it comes to your appointment and how significant is it in your estimation being the first Black and first lay leader of Holy Cross? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think this was uh, a major inflection point historically uh, for leadership and certainly in Jesuit institutions uh, when, in terms of shifting to lay leaders. Many Jesuit institutions had already done that, but uh, it the process has accelerated in the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, so um, something, some forces have clearly come together 
to really identify this as a moment where these changes are going to happen. I don't think anyone sort of said, oh, it's now time to pick a life president, but whatever the conditions are that made those choices available, they seem to have come together, uh, you know, quite rapidly in recent years. Uh, so, you know, I'm proud of that. I also know that one of the reasons I've been able to assume this role as a layperson uh, is because of a lot of the work that the Jesuits did in their institutions over the last couple of decades, I think, to uh, to prepare uh, people like me who are, were faculty members and administrators in Jesuit institutions uh, to take on leadership roles uh, and with, an, with the understanding, I think, that they had as, a, as an order that a time would come when there would not be enough priests to run uh, Jesuit uh, universities and colleges. Uh, so they had laid the groundwork. They were very thoughtful in uh, providing opportunities for um, faculty and administrators to learn more about the history and tradition of Jesuit higher education and to become partners with them in that work. And so fortunately, I was able to take advantage of a lot of those opportunities. And then when their moment came where I you know, had an opportunity to apply for a presidency of a Jesuit college, in this case, Holy Cross, I felt you know, very well prepared to take on a leadership role were I to be accept, uh, selected. And in this case, I was. And so I feel that in the work that I was that I had done with in partnership with the Jesuits, has come to fruition in a wonderful way. I, I have a great deal of respect for the members of the board who saw me as the right person in this time to take on that role. Um, and you know, when you make that shift the first time, when the, the first person to do it, that's a big moment. Uh, at Holy Cross has had a history of very strong Jesuit presidents uh, throughout its entire you know history, and uh, so you know I, I'm uh, joining some very august company, and I uh, so I'm you know truly honored to have been chosen. And then you add to that being the first black president, um, you know, at an institution that has not historically had a large population of black students. So uh, you know that's an important moment as well. Uh, I think. Um, there is obviously a strong history of, of African-American Catholicism in this country and around the world in certain places. And those are happen to be places where I've spent most of my life. You know, my family's from Louisiana and I grew up in Maryland. Uh, you know, two, two places that have strong African-American Catholic communities. But that being said, that's not typically, you know, what people don't typically identify African-Americans with the Catholic Church. Um, and um, and we are a relatively small uh, group within American Catholicism. So to be chosen, to be the leader, um, you know, is a great moment for the institution and for me and for, for African-American Catholics to see me leading, you know, this very, very highly regarded uh, liberal arts college, not only within the Catholic Church, but you know, within American higher education. And, you know, I rest stand on the shoulders of many, many others who've done work before me in, quieter ways or less visible ways to make this opportunity available to me, uh, you know, at, at a place like Holy Cross. So, um, you know, I'm proud to be here. I, I hope that my being here sends a message externally to a lot of people that, that this is possible and desirable and available to them if, if it's something they wish to do. Now you're coming up on your one year anniversary um, of assuming the presidency um, at Holy Cross. I actually noted that uh, you recently uh, hired, I believe, a new vice provost for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And um, I'd like to ask you, you mentioned about, um, you know, Holy Cross not necessarily being extraordinarily diverse in terms of uh, the student population. But I was wondering if you could talk about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion at Holy Cross. Um, and what are some of the initiatives um, that you hope to oversee in coming years uh, in the vein of uh, DEI. Yeah, we're really proud of the work. Uh, this will be our second uh, provo vice provost for the diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then our current uh, vice provost, uh, Tamika Wagstaff, will, uh, in July, will become the uh, associate vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the role will be expanded to be college-wide beyond the sort of core academic function in the provost office. Uh, we, um, as I said, yeah, our community um, 
our African-American community on campus specifically has never been mar large, but I would say it's all been historically very mighty. We have had some very prominent individuals who've come to through Holy Cross from the African-American community and have graduated from here. And uh, I'd say our overall diversity numbers are about 25 percent. And we'd like to see those go up. Uh, I would love to see us, you know, get in the low 30s, uh, you know, across a number of different uh, communities of color. But at the same time, it's not just about numbers. And one of the reasons it's really important to have a strong leader uh, leadership team around issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and a strong commitment across the culture of the college is so that we can be a community that's welcoming and supportive. So rather than focus on bringing in large numbers of students uh, from various communities of color and not have in place the kinds of programming and support that they will expect and need, we can do both. You know, we can start building that uh, those supports, building that community, working in the culture to make sure that it is a welcoming culture so that as people arrive, they really do feel that our commitment isn't just about getting you know people uh, here so that we can say that our numbers are good, but really building a community rooted in our mission and our values that uh, is uh, truly uh, respectful and uh, you know of uh, rich diversity and supportive of the equity and inclusion that is required to make those communities uh, really the kinds of communities we want them to be. If you might say a word about um, faculty diversity, as you know, of course, across higher education, uh, much has been said with regards to the desire um, to broaden the pipeline of faculty. As, if, as you know, of course, at many institutions, um, student diversity far outpaces faculty diversity. I was wondering if you uh, might say a word about DEI initiatives as they pertain to your faculty. You know, that's a great question. And that would be the pattern here. Our student diversity is ahead of our faculty diversity, but our, we've made great strides uh, with faculty diversity, particularly as we've hired new faculty in recent years. Uh, and you know, one of the reasons that a lot of DEI initiatives at colleges and universities begin with a uh, uh, an appointment in the provost's office uh, or on the academic side of the institution is because that is an important place to do this work. So when I was speaking earlier about uh, making sure that this is a community that is truly embraces equity and inclusion, one of the ways you do that is by making sure that not only do you have uh, you know, a commitment to hiring diverse faculty, but that you have a curriculum and academic programming and residential life programming that also reflects that commitment. Uh, so uh, there's important work that the faculty has to do uh, in collaboration with the provost and the broader college administration to, to think about those kinds of questions. What does our curriculum look like? What is the experience of our students of color in the classroom? Um, you know, is it a, a welcoming experience? Is it an alienating experience? How do we how do we make sure that we are doing the work we need to do to lift up all the voices um, in, in the process of, of learning and process, process of research and scholarship? Uh, what are we, how are we thinking about things like inclusive excellence, you know, different ways of uh, engaging our students around uh, you know, doing excellent work in the classroom and in scholarship? And, in leadership on the on the college campus, so you know those are those are long term. That's long term work, and those are uh, you know complex conversations that take time. So this is a long game we play. When we, if we really are committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we have to do it on a lot of different fronts, and it takes time. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm pleased with the work we've started to do uh, on the academic side with the faculty. Uh, but yeah, we we have we have more work to do, but we're very committed to that. My final question for you, President Rougeau, is with regards to the future, uh, the legacy that you hope to leave um, at Holy Cross. Obviously, this past year um, with the pandemic, uh, we mentioned the flashpoint of systemic racism. There have been uh, a number of issues that, you know, we would say um, have been crisis issues. But, you know, now that it seems as if we're settling to a quote unquote new normal, at least with regards to the pandemic. I was wondering if you could reflect and talk a little bit about your vision for the future of Holy Cross. Uh, what legacy that you hope to leave and 
what are uh, some of the plans that you have for the institution in coming years? I was wondering if you might reflect on the future of Holy Cross given uh, this past year and what you've experienced. <laughs> Yes, well, my, I guess my highest goal is to build on the extraordinary legacy and tradition of this, you know, wonderful liberal arts college that has always been committed to academic rigor and excellence, you know, broad liberal, liberal learning, you know, engagement with the world, uh, educating men and women to be with and for others uh, in the Jesuit tradition. So I, I, I'm, you know, I'm building on this extraordinary foundation. And so what I hope to bring is, is sort of a new level of sensibility and, uh, toward, uh, toward the future in an increasingly diverse country, an increasingly interconnected world, in a, in a vibrant city that is um, itself very diverse, um, and uh, to push continually, uh, as we have always done, toward excellence uh, across all the things that we do, Building a great faculty, uh, you know, providing students with with the absolute best possible liberal arts education we can provide, but doing that in a way that really meets the needs of today and looks toward the future. So that means, you know, addressing issues as you mentioned of, um, you know, racial injustice in a society where this is a real problem and um, where uh, you know our country is being ripped apart by issues uh, around. Um, you know, racial disparities and racial injustice, as well as issues like gun violence and economic disparities. And, you know, so being aware of where we are and what is going on around us, the fact that there is a brutal war taking place in Europe right now. Uh, what, and, you know, how do we think as a Jesuit Catholic liberal arts college uh, about our, our position uh, you know, as a global institution? How are we educating our students for this very interconnected world where problems like that cannot be ignored, despite the fact that they're very far away. They affect us intimately, as we know, in terms of our economy, in terms of immigration and migration. So really, you know, building up this college as a place of deep engagement and learning uh, that is very much connected to, to the current issues and the importance of, uh, you know, educating men and women for this more diverse, interconnected world and helping them become the kind of democratic citizens in the United States who are informed and engaged and critical thinkers who can really make the kinds of changes that we need happen going forward. Because we know there are lots of things we're facing in this world that need to be addressed and we need young people to have the tools to work on them, uh, you know, far beyond the time when I, I will be here, but I'll be very proud to leave a legacy that um, was one in which I helped young men and women find uh, the tools and craft the tools that they need to be those leaders for the future. Sounds great. Well, President Rougeau, I just want to thank you so very much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to join us here uh, at In The Margins. Thank you so very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure speaking with you.